So good to see you tonight. Welcome to Bible study. Looking forward to a great blessing. Find, if you would, in your hymn book, page number 552. 552. A great song for a Wednesday night. I love the chorus, the wonderful request to draw near. Let's stand. Let's lift our voice. I am thine, O Lord. Page 552. So look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thy. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I come to the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father God, I stand here tonight and testimony that um, of how precious it is and how wonderful it is to be drawn nearer, still nearer to thy precious side. And God, in the difficult moments of our life, to the grandest moments, I'm glad that I can stand and report that our God is faithful. And Jeremiah had it right when he said, great is thy faithfulness. The songwriter nailed it when he wrote, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Sometimes we can think that we're just maybe set aside or not as important or whatever, but that great promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us is a promise of faithfulness to all of your children. And I thank you, God, that with you, you're no respecter of persons. You are a father who loves his children equally. And I thank you for that. We're looking forward to a great time tonight in the word of God, a time that we need to lift us. And I would pray, God, a time that you would draw us nearer to thee. We, we, we stray so quickly and get so far, and this is an opportunity to be brought back to the foot of the cross where we need to stay. We love you. Thank you for loving us first, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Turn around, shake hands. Welcome everyone around you now.
you come back to your place now. Three, four, two. Three, four, two. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Great old hymn that'll strengthen us tonight. Page 342. Lift your voice. Rock of ages clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no language know? These were sin. Thou must save and thou alone In my hand no price I bring Simply to thy cross I cling While I draw this fleeting breath When my eyes shall close in death When I rise to worlds unknown seated if you would please so good to see you tonight welcome to bible study it truly is good to be home on behalf of beverly and our family want to say thank you for praying for us and welcome us back we uh had to jet out quickly for beverly's dad's service but we had a wonderful service and a wonderful time and he's with the lord and we felt the prayers of God's people. Unless you've ever felt the prayers of God's people, you don't know what it is to feel the prayers of God's people. But once you feel the prayers of God's people, you don't ever want people to stop praying for you. I don't know, man, alive, what a, what a tremendous blessing it is. And thank you for the cards, notes, gifts, calls, prayers, just um, blessed us in our moment of need. And um, we're so, so grateful for that. Thank you for Sunday. Man, did I want to be here on Sunday. And I kept, pardon? Breakfast was great. I heard breakfast was great. And uh, I kept spying on you through the video cameras. They got those things, they got those things hooked up to my cell phone so I can just punch in my cell phone and pull up all these cameras. And some of you look different on camera than you do in person. But uh, I could tell you were having a great time, and and uh, we we wanted to be there. And but uh, praise God, I heard Brother Steve did a good job. The music was great. The service, sweet spirit. Thank you for just loving the Lord and picking right up and serving Him, and went without a hitch. And so um, I trust that you enjoyed that day and enjoyed your evening. A lot of announcements to make before our preacher comes. Um, and of course from Sunday, but I want to make just a couple of them that are in the prayer bulletin tonight. Don't forget now that the ladies in prayer will be on October 6th. So next Tuesday night will be the first ladies in prayer meeting and that meeting will be here at the church. And um, we sure want you to come and spend some time in prayer and uh, interceding at the throne of grace. Men, we're going to have a men's breakfast on October 10th. Somebody asked me um, what time, that's at 8 o'clock there, and we're going to spend some time together eating and praying with one another, have a challenge from God's Word. It should be a good time, should last about an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes, and we'll get you home so you can do the chores that your wife wants you to do. And women, I promise you, if you give us your man for an hour, you'll get two hours worth of work out of him, okay? So uh, you urge him to come. And if he says he doesn't need to be there, you, you, you show him why he does need to be there. And I put the upcoming events all the way in through the end of December into the bulletin on Sunday. So Lord willing, you were, you were able to uh, go through those and put those on your calendar. And um, we do have 
reason to pray tonight and some things that we want to report as far as a request and some thank yous and so on. So we look forward to doing that at the end. It's my privilege tonight to introduce to you Pastor Michael Bernard. And Pastor Mike, I first met down in, um, I believe it was Kingston, the first time that we met down in Jamaica. He pastors the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Kingston, Jamaica. Just a wonderful church in that city that has a tremendous influence and lighthouse for the gospel. They have a large Christian school there that really uh, meets the need of the community. This is the church that Brother Hugh Black is the has been ordained an evangelist out of. And so when Brother Black goes down to Jamaica and preaches, this would be one of the churches that would be included there. I had the privilege of being at that service and had the opportunity to preach that night and just a delight and a joy. And so he came in on us last week, snuck in on us, and he was here. And um, I don't know, after church, the Lord just laid on my heart to ask him to speak. And I'm glad, I'm glad he did, especially coming back from what where I've just come from. I'm looking forward to just sitting there and being preached to. If he preaches like he sings, we are in for a treat. The guy can carry a tune down there. I stop. Whenever I'm by a preacher that can sing, I just stop singing and pretend I'm looking at my notes, you know. So uh, he, he did wonderful. He's going to bless us. Would you please welcome Pastor Michael Bernard to Plantation Baptist Church? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pastor Hunter. And I'm so grateful for allowing me this privilege to be able to share in your Bible study this Wednesday. You know, Plantation Baptist Church has become my home church away from home. Amen. This is my third visit, when I say visit, in terms of flying in and out. And indeed, it has been a blessing. I'm really privileged and I'm really honored, brother, for you to have asked me to share in your Wednesday Bible study. As was mentioned earlier on last Sunday's breakfast, are you understanding my accent? Yes. Is it okay? <laughs> Just keep on being slow like that, that's okay? All right, good. Last Sunday's breakfast, brother, you missed it, really. It was really great. And not to mention, brother Steve brought a great word. Praise Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So I bring you greetings from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Kingston, Jamaica. And while you celebrated your 53rd anniversary, we celebrated our 30th last August, the 21st of August, we celebrated 30 years of God's faithfulness. I've been in Florida for the past nine days. I wouldn't say I'm on vacation. I would say I'm on rest because I've not had a vacation in over two years um, since my pastorate. Um, it's been great, great going. Olive and the kids would normally join me when I'm on vacation, but um, since I'm on rest, I'm resting for a proper vacation. Amen? <laughs> I like that you like that, right? <laughs> By the way, my wife, Olive, she sends her condolences to the hunters and um, praying God's blessing. We are praying for you back home. All right? I got saved on the 1st of January, 1993. And then I got baptized that same year by my first pastor, Brother Hugh Black. Where is he? At the back there. Brother Black, our founder, now an evangelist, as Pastor Hunter mentioned. Um, and perhaps towards the end of my, um, my preaching, I'll probably share my testimony if time permits me to do so. But Pastor Hunter, um, Sister Beverly, um, Sister Suzanne, and Brother Black, they were at um, our induction and commissioning of Brother Black as an evangelist two years ago. And I must say that your pastor has been building quite a reputation for himself in Jamaica. They call him the top shelf preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those of you who don't know what that means, he preaches the uncompromising word of God. And that's a blessing. It's a blessing to have a man of God who preaches God's word. I encourage you as a church to continue to pray for the hunters. Sister Beverly and the rest of the family as they go through this grieving process. It will take some time. I was here last Wednesday and saw the outpouring of love. And let me say this, if you're here and you're not, you're a Christian and you're not a member of a church, you're missing out on a whole lot. Amen. You are an orphan. And if you are not connected to a church, a Bible-believing church, where people can pour out and encourage and pray for you, then I'm telling you, you're missing out on a whole lot. Amen. 
Pastor mentioned the prayers. He felt the prayers of the saints, and that's good. So I want to encourage you to be a part of a good Bible-believing church, such as this one, if you're not yet a member. Now, as you think about the wisdom and the majesty and the power and the greatness of Almighty God, have you ever thought, have you ever wondered in your mind that God can't do some stuff? I'm sure we have. Turn your Bibles with me to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. And while you turn there, we're going to be going zero in on one verse. Well, I say two. Verse 17 initially. Just to give you a bit of background, Jeremiah was imprisoned in Zedekiah, king of Judah's house, and he opened a prayer to Almighty God in verse 17. And it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. You know, in verse 27, God answers Jeremiah's prayer in a rhetorical way. Look at verse 27, if you will, with me. Behold, this is God um, speaking now. Verse 26 says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Listen to this. Is there anything too hard for me? That's what is known as a rhetorical question. Of course, we all know the answer. There's nothing too hard for God. The Bible also tells us in Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. The B part of Mark's gospel echoes that truth also. Mark chapter 10 and verse 27, for with God, all things are possible. And implied in that statement is the fact that God can do anything. Do you believe that, friends? Amen. God can do anything. And I'm sure that you will agree with me that that's the only conclusion that we can draw here this evening. Now, if I were to put two sentences beside each other, or two statements. For example, with God, all things are possible, along with the second statement, which says, God cannot fail. You would have what is known as an oxymoron. Some of you here are English majors. I wasn't good at English. In fact, my English teacher kicked me out of the class <laughs> when they started to talk about automatopoeia. Is that a word? And um, personification. I didn't know what they were talking about. I never did good at English, but I found this in a dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, and the definition that I got for an oxymoron is this. And I quote, an oxymoron is a compressed paradox, a figure of speech in which seemingly contradictory terms appear side by side. Now, there are popular examples of oxymora. That's the plural. Some would say oxymorons, but oxymora is acceptable. For example, no choice. Let me use it in a sentence. I had no choice but to accept Pastor Hunter's invitation to preach this afternoon. Another one, a small crowd. Have you ever heard people say there was a small crowd gathered to watch the fireworks later on, perhaps this, this, this um, month? Next month, you're going to be lighting up your um, Christmas um, lighting over by the park. Is that correct? correct? I can't imagine how beautiful that's going to be. Here's another one, pretty ugly. <laughs> And I use it in a sentence. The color on your truck is pretty ugly. No, I'm not picking on anybody. No, no. Please, don't be, be nice to me, all right? Now, having said that, with God, all things are possible. Or expressed another way, with God, nothing shall be impossible. God cannot do several things. Now, don't start stoning me now. There are several things that God can't do. I'd like for us to consider before we leave this evening four things that God cannot do. But before we do, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our God and our loving Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here this evening. Father, again, I ask that you will comfort those who are experiencing grief, sadness, depression, even loneliness, or health issues. I pray that you will challenge the believers here this evening to be faithful to the call and to bring conviction and conversion to anyone who may be undecided about a choice, including that of salvation, for your glory and for your honor. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless your word to our hearts, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Four things that God cannot do. Number one, God cannot lie. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. 
Verse 18a says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now the two immutable or unchanging things are his promise and his oath. God's promise and God's oath. The promise as mentioned in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. It says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. But look at verse 17. Wherein God willingly, more abundantly, to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Think about that for a moment. The promise in verse 13 pledged is faithfulness and justice. The oath in verse 17 speaks of all the infinite perfections of his Godhead. For he swore by himself. There was nobody else for God to swear with but by himself. Amen. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19a. God is not a man that he should lie. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. In the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You know, Pastor Hunter mentioned the same verse, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, in a different context last Wednesday at the Bible study, as he shared that this was one of the four things that gives us hope, eternal life. But that same verse says that God cannot lie. So he can be trusted, amen? amen. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, a, God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar. You see, friends, the world is filled with liars. I was going to say all men are lies, but I know I would get into trouble. <laughs> because that would make some of you ladies agree with what they, you already knew from your experiences, right? <laughs> so I'm going to put it this way. All human beings are liars. And everybody say? Amen. Amen. John 8, 44 tells us, among other things, that the devil is a liar. In fact, the Bible tells us that he's the father of all lies. A couple of chapters over in John 10, 10 tells us that the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And one of the devil's powerful weapons that he uses against mankind is lying. Lying. The serpent used it to deceive Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. When he said, half God said, twisted the word of God. Now if I make a promise to do something and I don't do it, what does that make me? What did you say, Pastor? Oh, I thought you were going to use a euphemism. Call it what it is, a liar. Our response oftentimes to the question, how are you today, is very kind. Wouldn't you say that? I'm fine. I'm doing good. But you know what? Sometimes we don't do so well. We're not doing so well. Why do we say that? That's lying. One pastor said this. He doesn't ask his member when he's on a rush, how are you? He doesn't want a long story. He just say, good to see you today. You do that, brother? <laughs> and you're off. <laughs> how about this one? I'm going to start my diet or my detox tomorrow. I'm living testimony to that. Brother Buckner. No, he said that on Sunday right after dinner. And he's gone how many days? Three days. Seven more days to go, brother. You're doing good. How about this one? We service what we sell. Have you ever seen that sign before? And the service is rotten. <laughs> I read about a store manager who overheard his assistant telling a customer, no ma'am, we haven't had any for a while, and it doesn't look as if we'll be getting any soon. The horrified manager came running over to the customer and said, of course, we'll have some soon. We placed an order last week. Then the manager drew the assistant aside, and he said to her, never, never, never ever say we're out of anything. Tell the customer that we have got it on order and it's coming. By the way, what was it that she wanted? <laughs> Rain. You got it? Ask somebody to tell you that joke after you get home. <laughs> you know, we lie about our age. Anybody ever done that before? Don't want to put you on the spot. We lie about our addresses, don't we? Yep. We lie about our telephone numbers. Did you give your husband the first time he asked you your number? You lied about it, right? We lie about our taxes. Yep. We even lie about our relationships. 
One famous Jamaican international artist even made a hit out of it. It wasn't me. <laughs> you know, friends, but our God, he cannot lie. Amen. He cannot lie about his love. There are so many adjectives that we can use to describe God's love. Last Wednesday, we sang the hymn, The Love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. It goes beyond the highest stars and reaches to the lowest depth. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Precious, precious. God's love is unspeakable. We can't understand it, but we know we have experienced it. And if you're a believer here this evening, we can never, ever be separated from it. If you don't believe me, read Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39 when you go home. God's love is unending. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. God's love is eternal. God's love is unselfish. It asks for nothing in return. However, it leads man to repent and turn to God in love. 1 John 4 verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. God's love is unmerited. It cannot be earned or deserved. His love is based upon his grace. God's love is unconditional. It is not based upon what we can or cannot produce. It comes from the heart of God. Amen. Man can never ever reach a place when he will not be loved by God. Think about that. Think about that. Perhaps somebody needs to be reminded of this right now. Even John 3, 16, for God so loved the... You can put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love is also supernatural. His love is satisfying. His love is sacrificing. And this is what led him all the way to Calvary. He didn't turn back. He went all the way to Calvary. God cannot lie, friends, because it would go against his character. God cannot lie because he's a keeper of truth. Turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 146 and verse 5. Psalm 146, verses 5 and 6. I love to hear those Bible pages turn. God bless you. Thank you for carrying your Bibles with you to church. Amen. Psalm 146, verses 5 and 6. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope, Pastor Hunter, hope, is hope is in the Lord his God. Verse 6. Which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. God is the keeper of truth. Several promises have been made in the word of God. And God is going to keep every single one of them. Amen. Because he cannot lie. How about this one? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that, friend? For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen. Amen. Unto the glory of God by us. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. Number one, God cannot lie. But number two, God cannot change. Now, if you were to do a, an informal survey, you're going to find out that 90% of all the items that are in, the, in your supermarket didn't exist 10 years ago. I'm serious. When I was a boy growing up, I would never, ever have imagined that I would be buying water from a bottle and drinking from it. How many of you <laughs> dreamt about that? I never dreamt of that. Never dreamt of that. Researchers tell us that more information has been produced in the last 30 years than in the past 5,000 years. It is estimated that 50% of graduates that are going into jobs are going into these jobs that didn't exist when they were born. Has anybody ever heard about a cloud services specialist? Anybody ever heard about a, a cloud services specialist? That's a new one. How about a, a digital marketing specialist? Anybody ever heard about that? Yep. These are positions that are available. And over the past, since the past five or so years. Friends, the way things change so rapidly in the telecommunications industry, it is so amazing that we begin to ask ourselves, is there anything constant? Is there anything that is abiding? And my friends, the answer is an emphatic, absolutely yes. God and his word. Amen. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday and today and forever. 
James 1 verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is not a flip-flopper. Is that word acceptable here, brother? Yes, sir. All right. You see, friend, while the world is changing, God is not. And therefore, we can anchor our faith and hope in him. God is unchanging, but friend, he wants to change us. He wants us to change us, but only to the extent that we are willing to change. He wants believers to be conformed to the image of his dear son. And he wants the unsaved to be transformed from the kingdom of darkness into his glorious and marvelous kingdom of light. Number one, God cannot lie. Number two, God cannot change. But thirdly, God cannot sleep. I love this one. Have you ever heard the expression, there's nothing that can cure sleep but sleep? If you're tired, what do you do to refresh yourself? Sleep. Get some sleep, get some rest, that's right. But you know, without sleep, we get a little, I'd say, irritated. A little hot under the collar, yeah? A little short-tempered. Sleep helps to replenish the cells in our bodies. And without it, friends, we could probably eventually die. I've always wondered why for many people the best time to sleep is during a church service. Amen? <laughs> Especially when the message is being preached. I know you're not going to sleep on me tonight because I'm your guest, right? But please don't do it with Pastor Hunter. He's a nice chap. I like him. Imagine for a moment if God were to put on his pajamas and go to sleep. What do you believe would happen? Well, the immediate, things that, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is that the distance of the sun in relationship to the earth would shift. And we'd either fry or freeze. Think about that. All the planets would just go crashing into each other. And we'd all perish. Two days ago, we had a supermoon. And what did that cause? Flooding. I saw it on the news. It's amazing. You know, God's word says that he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it, it's going down. What if God was asleep? What do you think would have happened? Disaster? Definitely. God, my friends, is in full control. He, he never slumbers, he never sleeps. Psalm 121 verse 4. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Second Chronicles verse, chapter 16 verse 9a. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Family members and friends, you and I, we can take comfort in that. Amen. But whether you know him or not, the psalmist reminds us that God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Psalm 46 and verse 1. What kind of trouble are you in tonight, friend? The apostle Peter started to walk on water on the invitation of the Lord Jesus. But he became fearful and he began to sink. Because he took his eyes off the master. He took his eyes off Jesus. And he began looking on the effects of the wind. But he prayed a simple prayer. One of the shortest prayers in scripture. Lord, save me. Save me. Our God doesn't sleep, therefore he's just a call away. Psalm 145 and verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Psalm 34 verse 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart, and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. And friends, I take comfort in that. Amen. Number one, God cannot lie. Number two, God cannot change. Number three, God cannot sleep. But finally, fourthly and finally, God cannot allow an unrepentant sinner into heaven. Now, that's a hard one. God cannot allow an unrepentant sinner into heaven. In the gospel according to St. John, turn there if you will. John chapter 3. Look with me at verse number three. Jesus told a religious ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus this. He said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look also at verse five. 
Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of people will call us narrow-minded Christians, but nothing is wrong with that. Because Jesus was a narrow-minded person, wasn't he? Right. After all, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In fact, Peter added to this in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. He says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I go back to where I started. With God, nothing shall be impossible. I grew up in the Anglican church in a parish called St. Thomas in Jamaica. You call it the Episcopalian? Episcopalian, Episcopalian right, here in the States. I was confirmed. I sang in the choir, and I participated in the liturgical rituals. I call them rituals. But I knew I wasn't saved. I knew that if I died, I'd go straight to hell. A womanizer, a blasphemer, filled him out until I stepped into a different church, an evangelical church. And I have to use that word guardedly. It was a watch night service. You know watch night here in the States? You know what they call watch night? It's the last night of the old year. It was the 31st of December, 1992. And I heard the gospel. And the preacher said that there were two types of people in the crowd that night. Those who were professors and those who were possessors. I knew it in my heart that I was a professor, a person who claimed to know Christ as his personal savior, but I never knew him. I wasn't a possessor. I was a professor. Never possessed the Holy Ghost. And so at the end of the service, which was just about um, minutes after 12 in the next day, the preacher said, let's come to the altar. All of us come to the altar and give God thanks for sparing our lives to see a new year. Of course, I went. Had no plans at all to be saved. And as I knelt at that altar, my life came before me. And I was the last person on my knees sobbing like a baby. You know what I did? I repented of my sin and I asked Jesus to save me. And guess what? He did. Amen. He did. Amen. Shortly after I started to attend the Bible study at Emmanuel Baptist Church where I met Brother Hugh. And he baptized me a few months later. Of course, when I told my friends, some of them were elated. But others gave me some time to come back into the world. Why? Because they felt that what had happened to me wasn't possible. But with God... All things are possible. You see, friends, a holy God could never ever allow an unrepentant sinner into heaven or else the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ would have been meaningless. Meaningless. God did not send his son to call the righteous but sinners unto repentance and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Remember, friends, that God can't lie. And therefore, as his children, God wants us to be truthful. 3 John 1 verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. God cannot change. As children of God, we need to be steadfast. No flip-flopping now. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thirdly, God cannot sleep. We need to be diligent, friends, about doing God's business. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come into poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. This is the last Wednesday. It is, Pastor of the Month, of your mission's focus. Your mission's emphasis. Culminates this Saturday with a banquet. Uh, a dinner, I believe. You have a special dinner for the, for the folk, um, Haiti. Mission the mission to Haiti, right. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you handed out a tract to somebody? When was the last time you shared your testimony with somebody? When was the last time you gave the plan of salvation to somebody? You see, friends, we, I believe, are the greatest hindrances to God's coming back. 
when that last person received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, then God will make his return in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I close with this verse. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you're sovereign. We thank you, Lord, that you are not a man that you should lie. We thank you, Lord, that you cannot change. We thank you, Lord, that you cannot sleep. We also thank you, Lord, that it would go against your will and your character to do all these things. But even more so, Lord, you demonstrated your love to all of us. And Lord, in the same way that you reached down and took us out of the gutter and saved our wretched souls, you want to do the same thing for many people. And you will never allow an unrepentant sinner into heaven. But we have the everlasting gospel. We have the truth of God's word. But Lord, we shut up our bowels and we get timid and we get cold-feeted. Because Lord, we, said, we say we can't do it. But we know that we can do all things through Christ which threatened us. So we ask you, Lord, for the power to overcome anything at all that would hinder us from sharing your word. Lord, bless your people. Continue to comfort the hunters. And Lord, just give your power to this ministry and all that is done here through Plantation Baptist Church. Use them to be a lighthouse and a witness to this community and beyond, to the glory of God and to the blessing of mankind. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Preach us the message, amen? God cannot lie, he cannot change, he cannot sleep, and he cannot allow an unexpected sinner to come into his, or unrepentant sinner, can't read my own writing, uh, uh, allow an unrepentant sinner to come into his heaven. If you've been saved, say amen. amen. Everybody that's a Christian, truly a Christian, has a testimony. When the preacher says, when have you shared your testimony? That's a big deal to you. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you should be able to take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and you should be able to write out a testimony of when you got saved. That testimony really is a, is, is, is a vital solidification of the fact that you've been born again. Well, Pastor, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. Well, Pastor, I just, I'm just, God just saved me. God, God didn't just save anybody against their will. There must be the humbling and the reception of the Lord Jesus. You need to be able to write down you may not remember time, date. For some of you, it was a couple of hundred years ago. I understand. <laughs> but you need to be able to write down, back when I was a boy, one day, my mama. Back when I was a little girl, one day, my friend, 1992. If you've never taken a piece of paper and written out your testimony on that, I would highly encourage you to do that. If you're not able to write out a testimony, you, you need to go see somebody and talk with them about the Lord. Well, Pastor, it just happened. Well, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, Jesus met the Apostle Paul, or Paul on the Damascus Road and saved him, but Paul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, he acknowledged him, and Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul was born again. Amazes me when I ask Christian people their testimony, they want to begin to say, well, I was baptized. If your testimony starts with you were baptized, you need to be born again. 
Well, uh, I've just, I grew up in a Christian home and I've just been a Christian all my life. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. Um, testimony is a powerful, powerful witness. Plus, that's how you do witness. You tell others, hey, this is what Jesus did for me. Um, and God will use that in their life. I'm glad that God cannot lie. I've anchored my eternity on the fact that God cannot lie. I'm glad he doesn't change. And I'm sure I'm glad he doesn't. That's a great thought. If God went to sleep, what would happen to the world? I, I'll give you, a, in, for instance, just go out and start on I-95, get on at Sunrise Boulevard, fall asleep at Broward Boulevard, see how that works. That's about the way it would happen, isn't it? You might be here tonight and you're, you're not a Christian. I would beg you to get saved tonight. My, um, my father-in-law, you know, went home last week and right across the street from the church is this couple that had lived there. They were old. Um, their last name was Goddard. Rich and Louis, Louida, Rich and Louida Goddard. And they sold honey made by, by the bees up there. And my, my brother-in-law, Adam, he loves honey. And you can tell, just look at him, he, he loves honey. <laughs> so he got up there with me on, let's see, we got up there Thursday night at midnight. And I know even though it was dark as he was driving by, he saw that sign that said, honey for sale. And all day he'd been thinking about that honey, been thinking about that honey. Friday we were at the church, Saturday we were at the church, Sunday we were at the church, Monday he got his chance. And has anybody seen Adam? I haven't seen him, he went on a walk. I know where Adam went. And so about six o'clock we were having dinner downstairs, the family had made dinner and we were there and Adam came in and he had this big cheesy smile on his face like he had this great victory and under each arm was this big jar of honey. And he walked in and he set those, that honey down. He said, now I need everybody to listen. There's 25 people in that room. He said, I want to tell you a story. And he got real different and he said, um, I went over here to buy this honey. And he said, those two people were at the funeral and I, I'd asked them about dad and so on, and they said for years, probably a thousand times in their life, dad Thieker had told them they needed to be saved, told them the gospel. And they said, we've heard him, he's told us a thousand times about this, and we know what it is to be a Christian, but we're not saved. They knew what it was to be a Christian, but they weren't saved. And Adam said, well, would you like to be saved? And both of them prayed to receive the Lord in their garage and got saved. And so that was just absolutely fantastic. And we celebrated that night with two big trays of fresh homemade biscuits just dripped in that honey. Man, that, that was heavenly right there. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Praise God, I'm not going to hell and be saved. Thank you, Pastor Mike. You preach a great message. We need these truths and um, enjoy it so much. If you have your prayer bulletin now, we'll take our prayer requests. We're going to get done early, but I beg you.